Bucks while we're at it. Great. Look who's here, Kellyanne Conway, special Hello. advisor to President Trump, Hi. joins us live on the Curvy Couch, not in D.C. today. How are you? D.C. soon. Yeah, 50, today. 53 days in. Yes. What does it feel like? Well, I always count the Trump administration days in dog years. <laughs> Seven <laughs> days for everyone, only because the president is constantly acting and making good on his campaign promises. You see the stock market loves his, his candidacy. Job creators love his, excuse me, his presidency. Job creators love his presidency. We have 235,000 new jobs created, many of them in manufacturing, in construction, in mining, less than 5% unemployment rate. And, and you already see the impact of his presidency. What I would um, love is the two numbers. I want the, you know, the normal... 4.7% of the people in there. But the other number matters, too. The people yes. who who are just out of the workforce and not counted. And let's just try to work on both those numbers. Is there, is, would there be a, a political issue with that? The president is working on both of those numbers, Brian. And I think the consumer confidence you see, the economic optimism, where, yes, jobs are being created, but people also just feel better. People are spending their money. There's consumer confidence. And also, when you repeal and replace something, as draconian as Obamacare, you're going to unleash more economic prosperity because people through these tax credits who don't get employer-sponsored or Medicaid-sponsored health insurance will have the opportunity, the choices, the competition to buy across state lines and get affordable care. You know, right now, people have, some people in this country have an insurance card and literally can't use it. Yeah. They can't afford to pay the premiums or the deductibles. You have five states and 1,021 counties right now where you only have one choice. One choice is not a choice at all. Okay. All right, CBO report comes out today. You had Bernie Sanders on. We well, had Democrats and Republicans on all the Sunday shows over the weekend. You had Democrats like Bernie Sanders saying it's ridiculous insanity. Listen to what he said. It is an absolute disaster. It is a disgrace. Uh, and by the way, this really has nothing to do with health care. What this has everything to do with is a massive shift of wealth from working people and middle income people to the very richest people in this country. In my view, and what the American people want is an improvement on Obamacare, not the decimation of Obamacare and throwing so many people off of health insurance and raising premiums substantially. I'm confused because um, when Obamacare went into effect, suddenly a lot of people who had been buying health insurance couldn't afford couldn't it. couldn't afford it anymore. And that's, that was one of the big lies, along with if you like your plan, keep your plan. If you like your doctor, keep your doctor. But look, Bernie Sanders ran on single payer and he lost. Hillary Clinton ran defending Obamacare and she lost. People want something different. They don't think plugging the holes and patching it up is enough. You need fundamental right. Reform. That's why with health savings accounts, you're in better control of your health spending. We're going to give these governors more flexibility in the way Medicaid dollars are spent. Those closest to the people in need will be able to administer it. And you're going to have, you know, when he says middle, a shift from middle class and the workers, that's absolutely false because what we're trying to do in our repeal and replace strategy here through the American Health Care Act is to take those farmers, those mechanics, those small business owners who currently can't access and afford care to be able to do that by pulling together in one place of these associated plans. That's prong three of the... Right, prong phase place. three, but the, uh, phase three is 60 votes in the Senate. That's so right. that's going to be the biggest challenge, and that is also where you get insurance across state lines. Yes. So that's going to take some wheeling and dealing. Tell me, uh, Kellyanne, the one thing, I remember the first time you came out and you said when Mitt Romney was going to be the next Secretary of State it was up there, you came out and said, I'm not comfortable with that. And a lot of people said, oh, wait a second, you know, is, is, that, is the president-elect comfortable with you saying that? Having said that, from what you've observed, um, have you seen that the president has the ability to do what he does best, and that's negotiate? Yes. So you have Elijah Cummings who says, he's talking to me about bringing the price of Big Pharma down. Yes. You have uh, Rand Paul saying, I talked to him, and this president wants to deal. But there's a sense that Paul Ryan doesn't want to deal. Is the president going to get his way on that and say, okay, this is the Ryan plan. I listen. I also listen to others talk, 
and I'm going to factor some of this in. The president and the vice president have leaned into this uh, legislation, and the president did what leaders do this week. He listened. He's negotiating, but he's also the ultimate Paul decision Ryan maker, and deal maker. Well, what, what the president has said is, if you have good improvements to the bill, let's hear them. And just this past week, Brian, he had leaders of the grassroots movement in who represent millions of, of people who are concerned about health care. He had 35 of the whips in. Vice President Pence was up on Capitol Hill at a lunch with the Republican senators talking about health care. The president had dinner with Senator Ted Cruz. He's talked to Senator Paul on the phone. He's working the phones. He's meeting with people in person. Oh, I know. And I think legislation as President Trump is really a great sweet spot for him because so far everything has been executive in nature. But this being the first big piece of legislation under his presidency, it's so appropriate that he's doing what leaders do. He's listening. He's negotiating. He's receiving many different inputs. But everybody knows, as is always the case, President Trump is the ultimate deal maker, but he's also the ultimate decision maker. But Sheryl Sandberg is, would be happy. You said he's leaning in. Did you read her book? <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> and, but this is the ultimate spark plug, though, for all of his plans, because right. you got to pass this first, and then comes tax, tax reform, reform, infrastructure. infrastructure. Uh, all the education reforms he's talked about. And the budget, the budget will be presented this Thursday, too. You have $54 billion in defense spending. We need a stronger military. We've been under-investing in our military. Mm -hmm. and there's an additional $30 billion Gosh, supplemental we all in there as that. well. There is. Wait, so, so John McCain, when he says $54 billion isn't enough, he should keep in mind there's a $30 billion sup, uh, supplemental coming There in? is. And there's additional funding for um, border control and there's additional funding for veterans. Uh, but anyway, we have just underinvested our military. And this is something that the president promised out on the campaign trail that he would never forget right. our veterans, That's our so military. Important. He talks about them being demoralized, underfunded, demoralized, and, and really just people who need equipment and resources right. to do their jobs. You know what's interesting is if this is an opportunity for Republicans, because you work for a deal maker. And if, it, if, the the, if the House and Senate go Democrat, he's going to do deals with Democrats. So it's up to Republicans to do something that he can work with, because he's going to be there four years, and these Republicans aren't if they're not productive. So the president uh, would like to have a Republican House and Senate. We're very happy that the voters said the excuse of divided government is over. We actually want somebody who's going to solve problems and give him Republican House and Senate. Frankly, Republican state legislatures and Republican governors also, largely in Republican control. I think that's called causation, not coincidence, that people want problems solved. You have in the White House a disruptor for an entrenched bureaucracy who went to Washington owing no one anything, and who in these first 53 right. days has made good on a number of promises not least of which uh, draining the swamp, but also being able to effectuate solutions, not just talk about them. You know, people are great talkers, but he's been a man of action. And I think you see this mm -hmm. most most specifically in the repeal and repay. You talk replace. about draining the swamp. Uh, yesterday, or over the weekend at least, he asked for 46 resignations. One of them refused, and that was this prosecutor for the southern part of New York. He refused, and so he was fired. Mainstream media had a heyday with this, said that this was abnormal, yet other administrations, administrations have done this in the past. What's your reaction or what's the president's reaction? This is just not a news story. It's a lot of noise, not much news, because it's very uniform and it's very common for presidents to ask for the resignations of a political appointees like ambassadors and like U.S. attorneys. The past few presidents have done this. And we made it uniform. The president made it uniform so that there were no carve outs. There was no special treatment. The only two people who well, are kind of exempted, if you will, are the people who are having a different role mm -hmm. in the administration, Mr. Rosenstein and, and Dana, who's the acting deputy attorney general. But other than that, it's uniform across the board. Well, what about the fact that apparently this fellow went in and talked to Donald Trump, uh, I think it was in November, and then came out and said, yeah, it looks like I'm going to be on for a while. pre -Pahara. That's the way he expressed it. But the fact is that this is just what I mean, this is what presidents do routinely. I, I don't think it's a so big I think news the, story. So I think the mainstream media is saying, well, maybe the, president, maybe the president changed his mind, or maybe Mr. Barrera simply didn't understand what was being talked about. The commonality and the uniformity of the resignations is the key here. Why, did, why is the president going to Nashville? The president's going to Nashville to take his case directly to the people with respect to uh, particularly repeal and replace. And he also will be talking about other pieces of his agenda. I'm sure he'll be talking about the incredible job growth, job creation, the low unemployment rate, the fact that you have many different industries responding to his presidency in these early days, Brian, by committing to not bring jobs to Mexico, by committing to expand, attract, retain a great American workforce and also to expand here on our soil and not go abroad. You see investment, energy investment. We're talking about infrastructure. It, by, by the time he gets there, the budget will be almost completed. 
tax reform. That's going to be this week, right? We're going to see his budget. Another busy week for him. And and the fact is that he'll go out there and he'll bring his case directly to the people. I mean, he needs to cut through the noise and the silence. He is our best spokesperson by far. And the noise and the silence of the news, sometimes they don't want to cover anything at all what he's doing. That's the silence. And then there's noise, things that are either misinterpreted or, um, or undercovered or, frankly, just unfairly covered. I think Donald Trump is at his best as the president when he takes his case directly to the people. He's the most brilliant communicator, most natural connector I've ever seen. And so the more he can do that and get out of Washington and take his case right to the people, I think the best it is. But it would be a national event, too. People will see it on the TV live sure. and in person. Kelly, Lauren. will you stick around yes, of for course. a few more minutes? Yes. After this break, we want to talk to you, continue our conversation with you. More pizza. President Trump has to provide the American people, not just the Intelligence Committee, but the American people with evidence that uh, his predecessor, former President of the United States, was guilty of breaking the law because our Director of National Intelligence, General Clapper, testified that there was absolutely no truth to that allegation. So uh, I, I think the president has one of two choices, either retract or to provide the information that the American people deserve. Because if his predecessor violated the law, President Obama violated the law, we've got a serious issue here, to say the least. All right, we have Kellyanne Conway, advisor to the president, on the curvy couch with us. We want to get your response to that. He's saying either prove it or drop the accusations. So what I was just tweeting out is uh, that we're very happy that the House and Senate Intelligence Committee have agreed to add this piece of the investigation to their, to their existing attenuated and unproven investigation about Russia and the campaign. And we will comment further after those findings are made clear. I also would note on a different program yesterday that Congressman Adam Schiff of California, a Democrat often on TV, said that he will ask Director Comey about this when he has him in front of the committee later this month. Sure. So this is, you know, this is ongoing, but we'll comment further after the investigation is going well, there, there, There's no doubt about the fact that uh, at least Michael Flynn was wiretapped. I mean, the New York Times said he was wiretapped. That's how they got his end of uh, where he was talking to the Russian people. And, and you know what this is about? The president has made very clear that he's incredibly concerned about these leaks from the intelligence and security communities. They're coming from somewhere where you have a readout of his private calls with other heads of states where you have... Uh, that particular incident that you've mentioned, Steve. So we know this happens. Um, as goes Trump Tower, though, uh, we'll see where these investigations lead. So right. has the pre is the president disappointed in the past president? And he thought it was going to be a good transition. And now it looks as though, from what he tweeted out last Saturday, saying that he tapped my lines to he believes that uh, Obamacare was time to blow up in 2017. Does he have a new view of the past of his predecessor? Well, we were very pleased to receive um, so much public help from uh, President Obama and some of his senior advisors, meaning they were out there saying we want a smooth transition. That's what democracies need, a smooth transition in power. Uh, but now it, do it does seem that some of President Obama's um, former staffers or perhaps his supporters are out there organizing against this president's agenda and uh, and perhaps, you know, going out and making statements that aren't particularly helpful or true to that peaceful transition of power. Sure. So and, and what about the people who are embedded in government? Well, who that's have the biggest problem in. of all. You've got you've got folks there that you know, we saw the New York State Times Department, article. Department to, of Justice. That's right. You've got and this is serious. This is where the this is where the alleged leaks are. In other words, you've got people in there who aren't supporting this president and his agenda. Right. And I would just point out the day after his masterful joint session address to Congress, which was lauded across the aisle, the New York Times ran an article that said the Obama administration was in a rush to preserve and sprinkle around the government intelligence information. They weren't expecting Donald Trump to be the president. Right. And so they were in this rush to do that. Why would you do that if it wasn't to hurt? Are you uh, confident you can find the leak? Well, I'm confident that the president is very focused on this because he's absolutely correct, Ainsley, that we can't have intelligence and national security leaks in a way. This is not a partisan issue. This imperils our national security. It's serious stuff.
Right. Uh, 500 positions. Now, no nominees for. Is that going to change? Is there, a, is there a pathway in the administration to get these nominees out there? Yes. Our Office of Personnel is very busy at all times. And, and the fact is we've got many qualified men and women who are applying for these positions. The Democrats held up our cabinet nominees for so long, we still don't have them all confirmed. I mean, I think that the fact that the president was able to get so much done in the first 53 days with so, mu so many sure. pieces of it lacking a cabinet secretary in that, in that particular department or agency is that much more remarkable, but these completely broken all records in terms of the obstruction and the resistance to just simple confirmation hearings of the cabinet nominees. So that has to stop. All right. Uh, Kellyanne Conway, you got to catch a flight and go back to work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to see you. Thanks. Texas and Florida, they've got to understand this. If we don't get this done, I'm not sure what would happen next year, Judge, in our midterm elections if we don't deliver on this key promise by the president and by all of us who campaign. So our caucus, the Freedom uh, Caucus as well, have just got to swallow hard and understand perfect can't be the enemy of good. We have to move this over to the Senate. We have to do it in the next two weeks. And we're counting on them as part of our team to not upset this apple cart because we're not going to give them their definition of perfect. It All just right. is not going to happen. So this is Paul Ryan's bill. So what does Paul Ryan do to convince those guys who were digging their heels in and saying, look, we got elected as these conservative, financially conservative, you know, tax, whatever they are, hawks. How does he convince them? Well, we've had meeting after meeting where he has stood up and he said, we're on a team. We are in the majority. We're not in the minority anymore. We don't have Obama as our president. It's time to understand the American public has trusted the Republicans with the House, the Senate and the White House. And we have to act, you know, in a manner uh, that uh, the public is expecting to get things done and not just to argue about them. So it's going to be a showdown. There's no two ways about it. Right. It's, there's going to be a showdown, and we are counting on our Freedom Caucus members to do the right thing for our party mm -hmm. because, again, woe be our party come midterm elections if we're going to the polls and we didn't deliver on health care or tax reform. Is the argument that the individual mandate and the employer mandate being eliminated, should that be enough to convince them to come to your side? Yeah, there's no question, uh, Judge. All of a sudden now, uh, those people that were working part-time jobs at 39 hours that got cut to 26 hours can go back to a 39-hour part-time job. Companies that want to grow beyond 49 employees to 55, 65 employees, they can now do that without a penalty. And the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of penalties, taxes, and fees, when they're gone, are going to be a jump start to our economy. This is mm -hmm. what we're trying to do to get the economy moving, create jobs, and eliminating the individual mandate and the employer mandate should be enough for our Freedom Caucus to understand just how good this is. Okay, and what kind of horse trading goes on? I mean, you know, what do you guys have to leverage other than, you know, a stare down or do the right thing, which I, for some reason that maybe it's the prosecutor in me or the cynicism in me doesn't convince me is going to do the job. What, what do you leverage? Well, I mean, there has been some talk, uh, and I don't know that it's going to go anywhere, about uh, the, the uh, cutoff date on the current expansion plan instead of it being January 1st of 2020, perhaps it could be January 1st of 2019. Uh, there's things of that sort. Uh, I'm not suggesting that's going to happen, but there are some tweaks. There's always a few tweaks. You know, perhaps when does a uh, particular fee or, or tax roll off? Uh, but it's not going to be anything major. I mean, the, the uh, deductible uh, or the ta refundable tax credits to help the lower income people buy them, we have to have those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some form of expansion has got to move forward. 31 states expanded Medicaid. They're going to have to cut the federal piece from 90% down to whatever mm -hmm. the states normally paid. Let's call it 50% in New York, 73% so, in West so Virginia. So more deal making. There's not much. Okay. To, but no, there's really not much more we can do. Gotta on go. our 27 hour debate okay. on the bill, not one single amendment, okay. not one was passed. All right. Congressman Collins, thanks for joining us tonight. Very good to be with okay. you, Judge. Okay, now to WikiLeaks and its release of internal CIA files that detail the agency's ability to hack into your smartphones and smart TVs. Joining me now is Kerry Cordero, former counsel to the U.S. Assistant Attorney General for National Security. All right, Kerry, thanks for uh, uh, coming back and joining us here uh, at Justice. Now, 
One of the things that we found out this week was that uh, thousands of uh, documents, uh, as described by Julian uh, Assange's WikiLeaks, uh, are now uh, apparently available or visible uh, and that we thought were private. And unfortunately, after 20 10 and Chelsea Manning, I think most of us just assume that information uh, it, within the intelligence community was being protected. And then with Snowden, we just assumed everything was being tightened up after that in 2013 with the uh, NSA. And, and I think that you, having particular experience in this area, more than most would understand that this kind of information being available or being, you know, vulnerable to hacking is extremely dangerous to us and needs to be more protected. What is the status of all of this? Well, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, this has been a continual problem. You mentioned this week's release by WikiLeaks included over 8,000 documents that they purport to include information about very classified and sensitive CIA hacking abilities. Um, and it does come on the heels of about seven years now worth of high profile, either unauthorized disclosures, leaks or hacks of either sensitive or classified information that the government retains. And why isn't the government in a position to protect this information? Now, I understand, Carrie, that if someone walks out the door with information and we can't figure out who we can, you know, uh, expect to, you know, keep a confidence and who we can't. But when someone from outside the government is able to hack information inside of the government, that's a real problem. It is. Well, each of these cases represents a different type of problem. Right. So um, if you look at the 2010 Manning case, the 2013 Snowden case, and then according to at least the most recent reports um, today, even in the Wall Street Journal regarding this latest CIA case, these are uh, potentially insider threat issues. Right. In other words, individuals who have access and who are trusted individuals, um, in some cases, government contractors who then steal that information and facilitate through WikiLeaks in this case and in the 2010 case, their public exposure. Well, you know, uh, Congressman Trey Gowdy actually said something like, it's no more than 30 people that we have to look at in the FBI and the NSA that could be responsible for this. And we have to use whatever powers that we have legally to, you know, confront them and get this information from them. But, you know, Carrie, I want to quickly, before we run out of time, discuss the fact that, you know, so there was a time when, you know, we kind of put an end to a lot of